So let's look at one of the problems in the woodwork. I had originally put it for uh, 11 15 today, but that was a mistake. So it's open till 5, as normal on Mondays. Um, but I do want to look at, I think it's number 7. Yeah. So let's talk about the can. So it says use differentials, right? So. So differentials is when we have a function z is a function of x and y. And we know that we're going to add, so we're going to have changes in both x and y. And then due to the whatever the rate of change is. So if we have z, So z is a function of x and y. And what was our differential dz? How did we find that? Sum of the changes due to x and y, which would be what? The rate of change times the change in x plus the rate of change partial with respect to y times y. And then you sum up those changes and you get the whole change in z. And that is what? That's approximate, like for small changes of x and y, right? Because that's that's really on the plane. That's really on the tangent plane. Those those resulting z values would be on the plane. So you got to be really close to your to your point in question. Small changes of x and y for this to be a, a, something that actually approximates z on the function. So how does this apply to this? Let's so use differentials. Estimate the amount of a material in a closed cylindrical can, height of 50, diameter of 20, um, thickness of 0.1 on the top, sides 0.05 thickness. So what does <laughs> differentials have to do with that? And they kind of, uh, kind of a hint here is they're saying, what is dv? dv equals something dr plus something dh. So this should start to look like something we're doing here. So how would we... Relate this. Yeah, Julia. Um, the change um, in the can volume yeah. for what it is to be transparent. Yeah. Is that change due to the amount of Okay. So that means we're starting with what? Uh, rate of volume. Volume. Okay. So what's the volume of a can? R squared H. So what does this have to do with this stuff up here? Yeah, v is like the z, and we have a z as a function of x and y. So here, v is a function of r and h. So we have a, look at that, multivariable function, right? So our, our z in this case is like v, x and y like r and h. And so is that a hollow can or a solid can? Solid. That's solid, right? So that's solid. So then what, and we, we know we can find dv, which would be what? Based on a little change in now, it's a little change in radius and a little change in height we'd get a little change in volume. So, so you imagine the solid can, but then you imagine a little change in volume. So you said shrink, I'll say expand for my pictures. So a, a little dv is like changing, increasing r and h a little bit and getting a slightly bigger solid can. Solid, right, solid. So then what does this have to do with a hollow can? Okay. That would be like the hollow. Well, we're not really using subtraction here, right? Yeah, so the, the dv, and this is what you said before. So the, the dv then is, the dv is like the, a little change in a solid can is comparable to 
kind of a way of estimating like the material of a hollow can, right? Do you see that? If you grow a solid can a little bit in all directions, that's like a, like a sleeve or, or like a shell. Uh, what am I trying to say? Peel, like a peel on the can, right? So dV is like the volume of material of the can that's hollow. So you really got to conceptualize all this first to really understand it. Does that make sense? Okay, little change in the volume is is like is like the metal of a hollow can. A little change in the volume of a solid can is like the metal of a hollow can. So that's where you're going with this. Any other? I just wanted to get the setup. See see how it relates to what we did with differentials. <clears throat> And they're kind of leading you along here. So you have to be, they're saying be careful with this because uh, what the side, the sides is 0 0.05 thickness. And the top and the bottom are 0 0.1. But you're going to, those are going to be treated differently because R and H are different kind of animals there. So you're going to have to think about how you have to treat those differently. Okay. And also notice they gave you diameter when it's so you radius. Okay, so there's some hints and some setup. Any questions on that one? <coughs> those are still working on it. Any questions? Okay, so nice application of differentials. Okay, so let's just, uh, while we, before we start new stuff, talk about the exam on Friday. So our exam is Friday. Uh, my idea is try to, uh, we'll try to get here at 11.40 and start at 11.45 and try to wrap up around 1.15, so like 90 minutes. So uh, that means staying an extra half an hour or so, right? We're out here at 12.40. So that's an extra half an hour after class. So those of you who can't, absolutely can't do that, you can't, uh, you have a conflict that you can't change, you can't stay until say 1.15 or so, I'm going to send an e a mass email out to everybody, just reply to that email if you have a conflict, and then we'll make other arrangements for you to take the test, okay? But hopefully most of you can stick around after class, or we can have an extended class so we have a full 90 minutes on the exam. Um, the exam covers everything up through... Uh, like surfaces. So at the end of the last test, we learned different kinds of surfaces, right? Double cones, paraboloids, spheres, ellipsoids, all that stuff. Really important. So it picks up there, and we saw all those things kind of again, but now as functions, right? We saw them as functions of two variables. So you have to know those surfaces, again, uh, as well as you did the first time, and then also in the context of functions. So that's where it starts. That's where material starts. And then all the way through, and then uh, through this week, but this week's stuff is much less emphasized. The, the most emphasized is up through uh, um, directional derivative. So directional derivative, partial derivatives, uh, space curves, acceleration, tangent normal, oscillating plane, all that stuff is the emphasized stuff. So what's heavily emphasized is up through directional derivative. This week is on there, but not as hem heavily emphasized. Okay. And I put, uh, uh, there's practice, uh, pra all practice exam problems. It's a lot of work. So uh, make sure you're identifying what you, what you have trouble with or what you don't have trouble with. So um, in case you don't have time to work through all of that, you're focusing on the stuff that you need the help with. Get working on that and then get in and ask questions. Okay? Or ask questions by email. Um, let's just take a look at that. Talk through this. Yeah, there's some other stuff to talk through there. Exam, exam, exam prep. So exam two study resources. Okay, so I have um, the there's the two homeworks, homeworks three and four, and then this week's five is on directional derivative. Those are all the key written homeworks um, for this exam, and I have uh, solutions for three and part of four. Here's the formulas I'm going to give you on the cover sheet. So this is going to be on the cover sheet of your exam, so you know. 
ahead of time, what's there. So, uh, and then I have this exam two practice is uh, pretty extensive. Like I said, there's some answers provided here. Um, and then there's practice problems from the book. So web work content, it starts at 007 to present. So in terms of the web work content, it's that. Uh, and then here's some practice problems from, or here's some practice sections. And then there's practice problems from the book. So I think it's all pretty self-explanatory there. But you got lots of resources to help you study. Uh, again, when you're working through problems, yes, you know how to, you know how to, how to do the mechanical things. But when you're working through, you got to just keep asking yourselves about meanings. What's the meaning of this? What's the relationship of this to this? So think, think through like the types of questions I ask in class and force yourself to ask those questions as you're working through problems. Okay. And then the exam two practice should highlight a lot of those kind of conceptual things too. Okay. Just, you got to really force yourself to, uh, Go beyond just how do I, what are the steps, what do I do to get answers? You've got to go beyond that. And it's, there's so much stuff here happening in, in, with the geometry of it, right? And the visualization, the imagination, okay? And those, those principles are really important. Okay. Questions on getting ready for the exam or the exam? Format would be the same. It's all multiple choice. I think this one is... This is longer. I think it's like 25 to 30 multiple choice. But you, you know, okay, so, but it's not, it's not do a whole problem and get an answer multiple choice, right? Lots of those are shorter. It's just a concept question, right? So it's not, it's not, you're not doing 35 problems, 30 problems, okay? But and then you, again, you got to know your surfaces. Know your surfaces and your space curves. Um, yeah, so, so this is, this, post here on Blackboard is very good, comprehensive of material on the exam. All right, so let's talk about let's just review here about partial derivatives. All right, so partial derivative. What are the partial derivatives with respect to x and respect to y tell us? For instance, about that point right there. Is it showing up as a red point? Yeah, right there, sorry, right there. Okay, so what do the partial derivatives with respect to x and y tell us? Say about that point right there. Sarah, what do you think? What's that? Let's do one at a time. So change in x. In what? Change in y. I got it bearing straight here. A change in x would result in what? What's that? Okay. So then, so yeah, for a change in x, the z value will decrease. And so then, what can we say? What's negative? Partial derivative with respect to x is negative. Okay. And then what about for a small change in y? What's positive? What's it? Partial derivative with respect to y would be positive because for a small change in y, what happens? Z goes, Z increases, right? Z increases. So the partial derivative with respect to Y, we suspect here is positive. Partial with respect to X is negative. So uh, let's talk about the second partial derivative. So you guys have done a little work in web work and I think in recitation, the second derivative. So let's talk about that formally now. 
So the second, so second partial with respect to x is this f x x f x x. And so what is that? That's just you take the partial with respect to x. That's its own multivariable function, right? That's a function of x and y. Take that with take that partial derivative with respect to x, and that's f f x x. And that reveals how the rate of change of z with respect to x, or how f x is changing with respect to x, right? So it's how that new function, the partial with respect to x, how that changes with respect to x. Okay, so now, using, since this is a rate of change, right? f of xx is a rate of change. So how could you describe its meaning with a set, sentence? What does, yes, yes, it's the rate of change of the partial derivative with respect to x. It's the rate of change of the partial derivative with respect to x. What does that mean? What does that mean? Get a partner, practice, practice. What does that mean? <coughs> Okay, you should have started this way. Given any small change in x, that is dx. Did you start that way in explaining this? Can you, can you finish it, David? What does it mean? What does a rate of change mean? So it means that given any small change in x, Matthew. You nailed it. You nailed it, right? So given any small change in x, the change in, in the partial with respect to x, how much the partial changes, will be that rate of change times dx. That's what we mean by rate of change. So this is the way we frame the understanding of a rate of change. Now it's just the rate of change of a rate of change. So it's how much the rate of change changes is going to be this rate times dx. Okay, suppose that, so given that, suppose that, that is a, that's positive. So suppose the second fxx is positive. Given our meaning for fxx, then what can you conclude? So given this meaning, what does fxx being positive mean also? Yeah? What's it? It is a, it is a four letter word. I know you think it's two, but it's a four letter word. Can't say it. There's... The rate of change is increasing. So he's saying that if this is positive, then that would mean the little change in the, the rate of change would be positive, which means that what about the rate of change? Increasing. Does that make sense? If the second derivative is positive, that means your rate is increasing. Right, so, and so this goes, goes for any, any rate of change of a quantity. If your rate of change is positive, your quantity is increasing. So that's just the same thing here. We have a rate of change. If this is positive, then that thing's increasing. It just happens that that thing has a rate also. See? Okay. So then what does that look like? What does the rate of change? So we're just going to look at z and x, just hold y constant. What does it look like when 
a rate of change is increasing. There's actually kind of two cases to that. If the function is decreasing, then what does that mean for the rate to increase? The rate would be But what does it mean about the rate? What's happening to the rate of change? If the rate is increasing. Let me give you, isn't the rate getting less negative, right? Is that an increasing rate? That's an increasing rate, right? The rate's getting less negative. Or it could, another way the rate could be increasing is if it's getting more positive. So I'm showing little segments thinking about what, like the rate of change on each of those segments. Getting less negative, getting more positive. So in both cases, what's happening? If, if your rate's increasing, then the graph is what? It's turning up. Isn't the graph always turning upward? Whether it's going down or going up, doesn't matter. It's always turning upward. And so that's what Alex said. This is concave up, right? Concave up. Make sense? Questions on that? Okay, so what if fxx is negative? What can you conclude? First of all, what's going on the partial respect to x now? Just, just looking, just not about the graph, but the rate of change, right? If the rate of change, if the partial, the second partial is negative, what does that mean about the rate of change of the function? Decreasing, right? Decreasing, because that thing is going to be negative, right? So your your little change in the change in the rate is negative, so therefore the rate is negative, decreasing. Rate is decreasing. And what are the two different ways? So just looking at z and x again, what are the two different ways the rate could be decreasing? What are the two different ways the rate could be decreasing? More negative or less positive, right? So here's the rate getting less positive. That's a decreasing rate, right? Getting less positive. Here's a also a decreasing rate, getting more negative. What do those have in common? The graph is turning down, right? It's turning down. If the rate is decreasing, it's turning down. Whether it's going up or down, doesn't matter. It's turning down always, and that's concave down. Okay, so let's do some practice here. Oh, pretty close. Did well. Okay. So how about now, why don't you talk through, I said it turning here. So I want you to talk through what you think, what you could say about the first parcels and the, these two second parcels. So all that's, so I just framed all that in terms of X, but everything in terms of Y, F, Y, Y. Everything's the same, just holding x fixed and going in the y direction, right? So those last two slides are, that last slide is all the same. So what can you say about f, those four partial derivatives at this point? Do you see the red point? Is it showing up? Yeah. Question? I was just wondering what, like, f, f, x, y means. Uh, so that would be how the... Parcel of x changes for a small change in y, right? So f x y would mean change y a little bit. And what does the partial partial derivative with respect to x do? It's a really cool discussion, but we don't have time for it. <laughs> okay, so go. I'm going to take attendance. Richard, what about the partial with respect to x? What do you think? So it appears to be negative. What do you guys think? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. A little change in x, go downhill. Partial respect to y. Julian. Um, if the 
it kind of looks like it's like zero. Maybe close to zero? Let's see, maybe this will help. You seem positive? It looks negative or zero to me. It looks like it's still on the way down. But So we could argue about that, but we understand it, right? It's pretty close to zero. It's pretty close to zero, okay? Whether it's... But to me, it looks like it's to the left of the, the minimum, but whatever. That's moot point. Okay. Uh, second. Okay, so what about now I've got this on? How about the second partial with respect to y? Second partial with respect to y. So what's happening to the rate of change of y? And what if it were right at the bottom? Say so that's the, yeah, this whole way, right? So all through here, even through the, the, the minimum and coming back up, rate of change is increasing. It's turning up, right? It's turning up. So you should have said FYY is positive all through there. FYY is positive. What about FXX? FXX, what do you think? Is the rate of change increasing or decreasing? Over here, what's the rate of change doing? Decreasing. Over here, what's it doing? So we're pretty close to an inflection point where the second derivative is zero, right? So there's like this moment of kind of like true linearity, right? Where it's changing from the rate, the rate is changing from decreasing, changing to increasing. That's our inflection point or that second derivative would be zero. Are we good? Make sense? Okay, what about over here? Let's see. I had all these coordinates written down, but then it didn't get saved. So let's see. Well, that's pretty good. Maybe a little bit less than Y. Here we go. That's showing up like that? Okay, go, all four. for that sweet spot right there. I don't know, where is it? Is it there or there? That's good. Okay, Simon, partial with respect to x. Uh, partial with respect to x is negative. Negative, because? Because it's down. Going downhill. What about the second partial with respect to x? What do you think? It's negative. Because? Because uh, it's going down faster. 
the rate is the rate is decreasing, right? The, all through here, the rate is decreasing. It's turning down. The graph is turning down, so the rate is decreasing. So both f of x and uh, partial respect to x is negative. All right, partial respect to y. Ryan, just the straight up partial respect to y. What do you think? Or what was I? wasn't what I was going for. So let's see how I did. Just turn this on. So for a change, small change in Y. you got to read my mind, guys. <laughs> so I'm trying to find that sweet spot. Is it there or is it there? Which one is it? There? I think that's where it was before. <laughs> that's where it was. So... Partial respect to y is very close to zero. Maybe, you know, we could argue negative positive, but very close to zero. Okay. And then second partial respect to y. Zero? Negative. All through here. It's turning down, right? For change in y, the rate of change is decreasing all through there. It's getting less positive and more negative. So even at the very top, second partial respect to y is negative. Okay, so that's good warm-up. So what about, so we want to talk about some special places here. Some special places where both first derivatives are zero. Where is a place where the both first partial derivatives are zero? He wants up on the peak. What do you think? How'd I do? Oh, nailed it. All right. What about right there? Both partials with respect to x, zero? Yep. Okay. Where else are both partials with respect to x, zero? Or both partials with respect to x and y, zero? Any other place in the part of the graph I'm showing? Very bottom of a dip? Like here? Okay. Yep. Both partials are... So So this is called local maximum, right? In the, just like in Calc 1. But now we have... We can go in more directions, right? So we, can get, we have kind of... We're not just going back and forth, but we can go like the directional derivative. We have two dimensions to go in. But no matter which dimension you go, you're going down. You're, you're going to decrease. So that's a local maximum. Here, local minimum. Same thing. No matter which direction you go, z will increase. So local minimum. And both of these would be zero there. Okay, any other places where both partials are zero? Yeah. What do you mean by that? What's that? That's where the the point where it's do the minimum in one direction and then turn the other. So right here is this. Is it a minimum or a maximum? What's that? Karen, why both? Let me see if we can do better here. Do you see that no matter which direction you go, if you go a little bit, you stay at the same z value? If you go a little bit, do you see that? Right there? So maybe I need to increase x a little bit. But you see the point I'm trying to get to. Let me increase y a little bit now. How'd I do? So, do you see that in this kind of diagonal direction, what do you have? Local min. But then you go orthogonal to that, and what do you have? Local max. Does everyone see that? So, so this is the part, both partials are zero. Both the first partials, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, are zero. Because if you go a little bit in any direction, you essentially, z stays the same. 
but it's not a local max or a local min because in, in some direction you go up, in another direction you go down. So it's called a saddle point because you see that's kind of like a saddle. Like here's your horse's head and here you, you, know, you sit right there and your legs go on either side and then your horse's head is up here, right? Okay, so it's like, it's like you can sit in it, right? You can sit in it. That's why it's called a saddle point. So these are the three kinds of critical points. We don't just have local min and local max, but then we have these these saddle points where it's kind of in one direction it's min and in another direction it's maximum. So we want to um, be able to identify those points. So let's talk about that. So critical points and types. So critical point of a function z is a function of x and y is any a, b such that the partial of x is the partial of y at that point, and they're both zero. Okay, so that's what we're going to define a critical point. Critical point is an ordered pair, right, of the or of the independent variables, such that your both your first partials are zero. So we, the, what we just saw in the in the graph was that it could be a local max critical point, it could be a local max, a local min, or a saddle. Point. So to identify what kind of critical point it is, we evaluate what's called the discriminant. It helps us to discriminate between local max, local min, and saddle points. Yes? Yes. Both first partial, first order partials have to be zero. And that's true in all these situations, right? In all, all these situations that we just saw, that's true. So like there was the second, the, before we had one where just, just the partial respect to y was zero, but the partial of x was negative, so that's not a critical point, right? All right, so the discriminant is this thing. It's second partial respect to x times the second partial respect to y. Minus this partial of x and then y times partial y then x. But I think you saw we didn't we didn't really talk about it, but you may have seen in the homework that those two are equal. These two partial derivatives we haven't really explored they end up being equal. So you can just find one of them and square it. So you can just do x y and square it. <coughs> So you don't have to find both. So what we're going to do is you're going to, you're going to get your critical points, these ordered pairs A and B, and then you're going to find this value of D, the discriminant. And so then if D is greater than zero, you've either got a local max or min. And if D is less than zero, you have a saddle point. And if D equals zero, there's no conclusion. You'd have to figure this out some other way, what you've got, maybe visually or checkpoints or something. Okay, so then the question is, if D is greater than zero, how do we know if it's a max or a min? Well, we already know that. We've already talked about that. How can we determine, if you, if you know you have a local max or min, how can you determine which it is? Second, Second derivative, right? So what about a max? What would we expect if we have a local max? Then what would we look at? What would we... What's negative? Yeah, you have a decreasing rate of change, right? Your rate of change would be decreasing, and if the rate of change of decreasing is if the rate of change is decreasing, then the second derivative is. So we're turning down, right? We're turning down. Second derivative is negative, and that's going to be both f(x)(x) and f(y)(y). Check either one. Right? Both of them, so I have fxx, but fxx less than zero and fyy will be less than zero. So it's just if you get one, then the other will be determined. Now, this is if d is greater than zero, right? This is if you know you have local max or min, then you just check one of the second derivatives. What about if you have a min? And what's true about the rate of change? The rate of change is? The rate of change is increasing. The rate of change is increasing, or the graph is turning up. 
right? Rate of change is increasing, we're turning up. And if the rate of change is increasing, then second derivative is positive. Second derivative, that's what we said, right? So this is the for so if you get d is greater than zero, then you have to do one more check of the second derivative to see if you have a local max or a local min. Okay. And that's some fun stuff we'll do after the test. All right, well, so we'll start an example here. All right, we'll start that example next time, and we'll just do this instead. All right, so I want you to find all local mins, local maxes, and saddle points, and count them. Okay, ready? Just kidding. But actually, this would be what? F equals this. Write this down. F equals all this stuff right here. F, equal, F of x, y equals that. Is that better? A little bit? So we're going to do the math to figure out, um, identify and figure out max, min, and saddle points. So just from the part you're looking at, what would you predict? How many local max, how many local min, and how many saddle points do you think we're going to get when we do the math? How many local max do you think? Just one? How many local min? One. See two saddle points there? See them? So this is saddle here, and this is saddle here. So we want to do the math to figure out that. So what does that look like? First, we've got to find out where our critical points are. So what's that going to be like? What makes a critical point? Right, so we're going to do the first partial with respect to x. We're going to do the first partial with respect to x. And we're going to do the first partial with respect to y. And then what are we going to do? Make them zero. And then we gotta we gotta keep this in mind when we're doing the algebra. This is what can kind of answer most of your questions when you're doing the algebra. We're looking for ordered pairs. Pairs of x and y values together that do what? That make both of these zero, right? So ordered pairs that make both this partial equal to zero and this one equal to zero. So anyone got the partial with respect to x? 6xy minus 6x. All right, and first respect to y is 3x squared minus 3y squared plus 3y squared minus 6y. So factoring is going to be a big part of these. We could factor out 6x, and we would get y minus 1. And this is for x, right? And why? Is there anything we can do there? We can't really do anything there. So we're going to focus on partial respect to x. And what does that tell us? So what makes the partial respect to x 0? There's two possibilities. x equals 0 and y equals 1. So is the point 0, 1 a critical point? 
No, we're looking for ordered pairs that make both zero. So what we need to do is put x equals zero into this one and see what y needs to be to make it zero, right? So if x equals zero, then, then we get, now we can factor 3y times y minus 2. So if x equals 0, then y could be 0. So there's our first critical point, 0, 0. Our next one is 0, 2. All right, what about if y equals 1 from the first, from the partial with respect to x? If y equals 1, then we get 3x squared minus 3 equals 0. And that gives x plus or minus 1. So you could divide by 3 or subtract 3, whatever, you'll get plus or minus 1. So that gives us two more. 1 comma 1 and negative 1 comma 1. Did you follow it? And then we're going to do the discriminant. And we're going to do second, get second derivatives and figure out which these are. And so we expected four, right? We expected four critical points and we got our four. So we just got to figure out which are which using D, using D and second partials. We'll pick it up there on Wednesday. Yeah. Is there a way to